Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mark's Backyard Birds, another edition of our monthly wild bird update. Uh, this one, of course, for July. Uh, a lot of people think that because July is typically a very, very uh, hot month, uh, that it, it, there's not much going on. But uh, July is a very busy month in the wild bird world. Let's see. Hi, Steve. Yes, Melanie is here tonight from South Alabama. We are, uh, Melanie just I picked her up for the airport just a little while ago. She's been uh, out east, uh, North Carolina, and she, I'm glad to have her here tonight because we're going to try to do things uh, a little more efficiently. We got some great comments uh, on our last live and suggestions, and and you know, like I said, we're we're really rookies at this, and we're but we're learning and we're getting uh, more involved, better with it. Um, it looks like you know we always have that period of letting people join in. Uh, it takes a little while. We, the number tends to to go up fairly quickly after we first uh, get on. But I always want to do my kind of my introduction and and ex explain the things for you. Anybody new that is joining in, uh, my name is Mark McKellar, and I am a wildlife biologist who been in love with and studied birds for now 40 years officially. Uh, June was officially 40 years whenever I changed my uh, traje trajectory in wildlife school from fisheries to uh, studying birds and only pursued bird jobs after that. So I've been, been in love with and studying birds for a good 40 years now on a on a personal and professional level. So, uh, and I am in Kansas City, Missouri. My wife and I own a retail bird store here uh, called the Backyard Bird Center. And uh, and we're in the Northland region of Kansas City, not very far from the airport. And we've been, this was our 21st anniversary this year. So um, that is uh, kind of the, our, what we do there. And when we built, we bought this business, we uh, decided to run it like a nature center and do things like this. And this, that we've so thankful that we discovered this avenue for via uh, YouTube to be able to communicate uh, and answer questions and, and teach about birds. I, you know, I do lots of programs over the years. Uh, I ran nature centers for many years and then uh, I've always done garden clubs and Kiwanis clubs and lions clubs and church groups, things like that, and talk about birds, um, and lots of scout programs, things like that. But this gives me the opportunity to to share my passion and, and knowledge of birds with a very wide ranging audience. And these lives are fantastic. You guys are great. Have a real uh, always interactive, and you ask good questions and. Let's see who we got. Oh, Jenny, Jen G is joining us from Maine. Delightful Gardens by Debbie. Good evening, bird friends. How are you? Did it, and are, are you in Kansas? I can't remember, Debbie. Is that where you're located? And that's one thing that we ask. If you would, when you, uh, you know, join in, if you would, let us know your name and, and whatever you want to go by. And, of course, where you're checking in from, what part of the country. And that really helps me when I answer questions about uh, the birds we're talking about or I address topics at what part of the country because I'm right here in the heart of the country in Kansas City. And, and you guys, I know Steve, obviously, in South Alabama is the south of us and, and uh, Maine is one of my favorite states and she's northeast of us. So when you guys, if you would, just let me know where you're checking in from. And uh, we're going to try to do something different tonight. Uh, I, I, it was pointed out, of course, that you know, we are streaming both on Facebook and on YouTube at the same time, and YouTube people can't see the questions that uh, Facebook people are asking, and Facebook people can't see the questions that YouTube people are asking. So whenever there's a question, we're going to try to um, put you up on the screen, and, and so people can see if I don't get to read the whole question, because sometimes I'll answer a question and it doesn't make sense because people don't know what to ask. So we're trying to get better at this. You know, every week we're, we're doing... Uh, getting, uh, I, I think a little bit better. We're every other week. We try to do these every other week. So let's see who we've got joining in now. Sandra C. Designs. Love the show and appreciate. Let's do this. See if this works. There you go. Love the show and appreciate how helpful the videos are. How can I keep algae out of my bird fountain? It is a tiered fountain with a pump. That you know, it, 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 that can be tough. Um, there are natural enzymes uh, products. So it's just a cap full uh, that you can pour into bird baths. Now, it helps with the brown algae. Uh, it doesn't do great against the green algae. So 
uh, when you've got these temperatures and you've got sun shining in a bird bath, the best solution is changing it regularly. Now, I know a fountain, the moving water should help. And the problem that a lot of people have when they try to use things like that natural enzyme product is they get bubbling. And so the, the companies try to keep the, the factor that into their composition uh, so that you don't get bubbling in the fountains, but to help to keep down the algae. So uh, there are there are those that, that those products available in the market. We always carry the ones just for bird baths, not the ones for fountains. Typically don't have as much demand for that. But uh, we find that the little cap full of that uh, carefree enzyme is the name of the company. Uh, it works really well. Uh, Songbird Essentials has a version of it as well. They uh, they they use for, you know, fighting against the algae. I change my water very, very regularly. So I just try not to let the algae get built up. But, you know, when you leave town or it, 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 the sun's really intense, it can, and it can be frustrating. And But if it gets ahead of you, you, know, you can use a very mild bleach solution or a 50-50 vinegar water solution to, and a brush to, to scrub it out and just let it air dry for a good while before you put it back in. So I recommend cleaning the bird bath at night or, you know, right after sunset and let it air dry overnight and then refill it in the morning. That way you've given time for, if you use 10% bleach solution, then that chlorine will evaporate very quickly. Um, but also vinegar water, that will evaporate overnight and then you can add back to it. And, and that seems to work for a lot of people. So Penny checking in from Northern Indiana. <laughs> this, this question, how do fireworks affect bird? I, first, I just... Uh, wrote this in our monthly email that I do through the store. This is uh, the, the my introductory paragraph of my this month's email um, because it is it, you know get a lot of questions about that and it, you know it's hard to know for sure. But um, and a lot of it has to do with when the fireworks start, where the birds are trying to roost, things like that. Uh, a bird that is uh, scared off its roost at night and tries to fly out is it is vulnerable for them to possibly fly into uh, something like the house or a tree or something because a lot of these birds don't have night vision as, as well like owls and other birds that are adapted to it. So if if the bird if the fireworks are going off when the birds are just starting to come into roost where they're going to sleep at night, they'll tend to move away. And, you know, birds have wings and they can fly a decent distance away if they're getting disturbed. If the fireworks start after they're already on the roost, then they may well decide to try to may ride it out like thunderstorms and things like that. Um, but if, you know, they're in a tree or roosting somewhere close and people are firing, you know, dropping firecrackers right by their, where they're roosting, then they would they can fly out and they can't hurt themselves or they can simply find another tree to roost in. So. Uh, I'm glad that it doesn't happen 365 days a year, but uh, you know it's it's a hard question to answer. But the the, the possibly it can uh, negatively affect some birds for sure, and of course. Luckily, it's not migration season for sure for the big fireworks shows and things like that. But birds can see and hear and, and, and they can fly away and avoid uh, a lot of that going on. So it's a good question, Penny. Um, let's see, Anita checking in from Central Arkansas. Denise is checking in from Washington State. Good to see here from you again. I know you're a regular. Let's see what we got here. We've got... Kevin in Cincinnati, Ohio. We were just out there a couple of weeks ago. I'd like to thank you for your advice with the Baby Blue Jay I found. Yeah, Baby Birds. Uh, it is that that is a program that I'm going to be doing. I think I'm scheduled, I'm going to do it, record it Saturday at the store on Facebook, and then I'll post it Monday night on YouTube. Uh, you know what to do because it is the Baby Bird season for sure. And so, uh, you know, the, the old wives' tale that you can't pick up a bird because mom will take care of it is completely untrue. Where birds have really terrible senses of smell for the most part, but you can pick a bird, baby bird up and put it right back in the nest if you know where it is and you can do that. But most of the time you don't need to pick them up because mom will continue to feed them. Now there are, you know, they get blown out when they're way too young. Then, But if a lot of these bird, baby birds on the ground are just a, a worm or two away and the and parents will continue to feed them. So let's see. Robert S. is from North Texas. Welcome in, Robert. And is that Stever Birds? I like it. They're from Northeast Illinois. Well, welcome in. Well, tonight's uh, update, we are talking about the July Wild Bird Update. And, you know, if you've joined in, if you've been on any of my other ones, uh, we've been doing these now for months, 
Uh, and each month I try to kind of give you a lowdown on what is happening. Thank you for the like. Uh, so, uh, uh, if it, don't forget to say that I'm not a great businessman. I'm a biologist, but it really does help if you if you like the videos to please click that uh, thumbs up or a heart or whatever and leaving comments. Uh, it just helps us up with the uh, algorithm if they call it with with YouTube. And the, the better I do there, the more they spread me around, and so people more people can join in and more people can learn. So thanks for for joining in there and 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 appreciate those likes and. Uh, but okay, July, what's going on? It, it, it again, it, it, some people will call it the dog days of summer, a lot of people call it refer to August as the dog days of summer. But July can be quite hot, and it is it was 100 degrees just two days ago, and it's 71 here, or was 70, think about right now in Kansas City. So, uh, highly uh, variable uh, when it comes to the, the temperatures and things. And but you know, the number one thing that's going on still in the bird world, uh, is nesting. And this is a little hummingbird, a female ruby-throated hummingbird sitting on a nest that's made of lichen and, fiber and uh, spider webs. And they are getting close uh, when it comes to being able to, to, to fledge their young. Uh, hummingbird babies are getting quite big by now at most of the range. I know, Steve, maybe you down there in Alabama have already fledged, I'm sure. Where, whereas up north, you guys got a little bit longer. But here in the heart of the country, we expect hummingbirds to fledge their young by about the middle to the third week of July. It just depends on uh, how many insects were available, when they started, if they got a, a cold spring, things like that. A lot of things can affect the start date and, and, and the hatch date. But we expect them typically to start fledging around the, uh, the third week of July. So for, for many of you, um, when you, in the spring, when you put out your hummingbird feeders, you, you know, your hope is you attract a male and it'd be a, a center of the territory and you'll have the he'll attract females and you'll have activity all, t activity all summer. For a lot of people, that doesn't work out. And don't blame the male. Uh, typically, it's because the female that came, that came along and he flirted with decided that your yard wasn't great for nesting. So she moves on and eventually that male has to move on. My advice for many years has been if that happens, if you're you're getting tired of uh, continuing to fill your hummingbird feeder and you and you haven't had any activity and it's really you know it, 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 you have a tendency to let the, the nectar go bad possibly the best thing you can do is bring that hummingbird feeder in, clean it up, and hang it out empty, and then leave it out there because if a hummingbird does happen by that that that, that you you're not expecting or hadn't been seeing but it comes by. And they try to drink from that hummingbird feeder. He just he or she thinks this flower has no nectar. So and they'll typically come back. And that is far better than leaving the hummingbird feeder out there and not changing your nectar. Of course, and you can make uh, uh, the the bird sick by doing that. So, uh, but with this advice, I have always said, mark your calendar for all my customers here. And so again, remember North and South, mark your calendars for about the third to the fourth week of July. And put, a, and put a note on your calendar saying, put humming, your nectar in hummingbird feeder, because that's when those babies are really starting to, to show up. So later this month, your increase in activity, and if you've not had them all summer, that doesn't matter, because territories are breaking down, and the babies don't know to be uh, territorial, and they'll come in and start feeding, and the, of course, there'll be dominant males and dominant females, but this is one of my favorite pictures that I have. And this is an older picture, but it does two wonderful things. One, it shows the length of that tongue. Hopefully you can see that. I know it depends on what device you're looking at it on. But that tongue is every bit as long as that bill. And those hummingbirds lap like a dog. And this is a great photo for showing that. But the other reason I love this picture is because this is a juvenile ruby-threaded hummingbird. And how we know that is by looking at its back. Uh, adult males and adult females have that beautiful sparkling green back on them, dark green back. Where look at this one, it's a gray green mottled uh, appearance, and that is a young bird. That's a hatch bird this year that is still molting and will be molting for a while into its adult plumage. So I get calls, and, and especially come August, I have three different species of hummingbirds in my yard, and here in Missouri, that's not at all likely it's, uh, it's possible, but it'd be extremely rare. What people are seeing is the adult males with the red throat and the green back. And they're seeing the females, which are the green back and the white throat. 
and they're seeing several of these guys. Remember, the humming, the young hummingbirds should be outnumbering the adults uh, they, pretty well. And again, they don't know to be territorial. So when they come to the feeder, sometimes you'll get two or three juvies uh, drinking from the, 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 the hummingbird feeder. And then an adult, male or female, will come through and chase them off. And they do that because the whole they know that they've got to fatten up to migrate where the juvies don't know that yet. The juvies, the young birds, they don't know the routine and they're just flying around and they're new to the world and they're just loving things. But your landscaping is so important because they're given diversity of diet and lots of flowers bloom in our region, especially in August and September. Uh, great for them, but your hummingbird feeders get used a lot. And this is the time of year a lot of people want to put out a second hummingbird feeder or a third hummingbird feeder uh, because they get the, the, the increase of activity. And for us, by mid-August, then we start seeing uh, uh, Iowa's birds and, and Minnesota's birds and Southern Canada's birds. They start migrating and we start seeing them showing up usually mid-August uh, to the late week, last week of August is really, and then first week of September can be huge in our area. So that's what's going on there. Let me see what we got here, Steve. Let's see what we got. We have many hummingbirds now, skinny little ones. Yeah. <laughs> Seeing multiple birds at a time, no chasing off, have to fill the field halfway through the day. Absolutely. you. Those are fledglings. That is a lot of what you got going on there, Steve, is you've got a lot of young birds and they don't know to be territorial. And they, so they, and then, like I said, a, an adult male will show up and he's a big bully and he'll run them off. Now in the hummingbird world, the adult males tend to migrate first. And we're going to hear this again with the Orioles. The adult males tend to leave first. And then the females are a little bit after that. And then what you're left with through the rest of the fall in the hummingbird world in, uh, in August and September are the juvies. And they don't know to migrate yet. Their bodies start pulling them. Uh, a day length is what triggers a bird to migrate. And so those birds will get that urge to leave and they don't know why, um, but they'll continue feeding and they'll continue fattening up. And then when the, the winds start shifting in their favor coming out of the north, they'll catch it and they'll start their journey south. And some of them will, will may even winter in your area, Steve, down in, in South Alabama, but most of them will go down into Mexico and the northern uh, Central America. So, hi, WK from Central Illinois. Welcome in. All right. Let's see. There it is again. All right. What's this one? Denise Jones. Hello, Mark. I always enjoy your videos. Appreciate your knowledge. We so you're learning so much about our feathered friends. You're in Ohio. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, Denise, we 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 love this and we and, and that is my goal in life is to educate. You know, we uh we absolutely hope this is what we're doing. And uh it, it you know, my passion has has been birds for so long, and we love sharing that knowledge with you guys and and hopefully these are these are helping you understand better what's going on out there. So, well, that's kind of it in a nutshell. What's going on with the hummingbird world right now? So, what's next? Uh, one of the most uh, popular uh, birds that we always talk about here in our lives. We have lots of bluebird questions. So, this is a male eastern bluebird. Well, I, I consider him the most patriotic bird we have. Uh, he is red, white, and blue, and uh, that's I hope everybody had a safe and happy. Uh, Independence Day, but this is the bluebird, uh, Easter male bluebird, and it depends on where you are. Uh, there, these birds are in various states of finishing up nesting or starting a new nesting. They, uh, like we have customers that have fledged two broods already, and they're starting into their third clutch of eggs and, and, and nest. And uh, some people, this are they're only kind of in the middle or toward the end of their second nest. So it just depends on where they are in the nesting cycle. But if these birds have already nested twice a season, they're probably going to nest four times, which is really cool. You know, if they get started early and they have a successful nest and, and August and, and early September are not horrid as far as drought or uh, really hot temperatures, they'll excuse me, they'll attempt another nest and, and oftentimes get a fourth nest in in the nesting season. So that's, it, you know, they're they're absolutely beautiful birds and we love them. And it just depends. Remember, uh, important for the bluebird landlords, remember they will not reuse the nesting material. So definitely clean the nest material out after each nest uh, and she will put new fresh nesting material in. And that's, that's just a safeguard one, of course, is that 
if potentially there were feather lice or anything like that in there, any other insect problems, you don't want to pass those on to the next nest. So get that, clean out that nest and put it, in, she'll bring in her own uh, nesting material. And don't forget the nest lifts. We love the nest lifts that keep the nest off the bottom of the box, which protects the birds uh, against insects and moisture, you know, getting the, the grass wet in there and, and that propagates the insects even more. So who we got joined in? How do you pronounce that? Leos from Fall River, Massachusetts. I went to college with a guy from Worcester up that way. So welcome in. So that's what's going on with bluebirds. So they'll continue all summer. And then the next bird that generates a lot of questions right now are the Baltimore Orioles. Because Baltimore Orioles only uh, nest once, typically. And they are at the point where they're just about to start bringing in their babies. And they, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't surprise me if somebody called today and said, I had a, a, a this scene playing out, which is an adult male oriole fe feeding uh, a juvenile, a baby, a fledgling, and uh, stuffing, uh, teaching them where the jelly is, and giving them some, uh, some some jelly in this picture. But that'll start happening here, and that usually happens the first couple of weeks of July uh, when we see this this play out. So this should start to happen now. Uh, so if you don't have any jelly out, you may want to put some out, but also put mealworms because mealworms, they will take advantage of those mealworms to feed those babies as well. So if you don't have those out, that's a, a really good offering for parents of all birds is to, to feed their, their babies. But uh, the one thing that, that really gets people and it can, can confuse people is the, the Orioles will, will pretty much disappear by the middle of July toward the late last part of July. And that is the start of their migration. They're one of our earliest migrating songbirds. So the, the males will bug out first. The adult males will, uh, and they'll start their journey. And they kind of meander and wander and, just, and they don't, you know, take off and fly and go to uh, Costa Rica overnight. Now, this is, they'll work their way uh, south. And I know in the fall along coastal North Carolina and that area where I'm from, my best time of seeing Orioles were in the fall uh, in, in, you know, around the ocean, the edge of the ocean. They, 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 a lot of those birds uh, moving south then. So you may see this um, play out in your uh, in your yard, hopefully now, but then the males will leave. And again, just like the hummingbirds, then the feed, adult females will leave shortly after that and the last to leave. And then people will go, Okay, well, I'll take everything down and, you know, clean everything up. And the next thing they know, they see an Oriole out there in September. And people will call and say, my Orioles are back. Eh, probably not your Orioles. These are probably migrating birds from, you know, further north, you know, up the, uh, our friends up in Minnesota and southern Canada and those northern tier states. Those Orioles, you know, are much later starting nesting, and so they're much later migrating. And and they show up uh, you know, passing through, and a lot of people think that they're, they're, they're birds and just came back. Is it possible that, that, that it could be some of those birds? Yes, it's possible, but not likely. It's very much uh, more likely that those are uh, more northern birds that are coming, passing through. Let's see what we got. Let's see. Oh, Steve, live or dried mealworms. Either or. Uh, it dry, live mealworms are far better for the young. Uh, they have a lot more moisture, and of course, the guts and everything inside of them are, are much more nutritious. The drying uh, process uh, for the, the dried mealworms does take away a lot of what they need. Uh, some people will, can, will actually rehydrate their worms, which will soften them up uh, by using hot water and let them soak uh, and give them moisture content, but it doesn't restore the nutritional value. So Live mealworms, if you're willing to do that, uh, and, and then dried mealworms are also useful. A lot of people use the live mealworms to train them. You know, they, that, lot, that movement of those live mealworms will draw the birds down to eat them, and then they can mix in the dried mealworms to kind of train them to, uh, to eat those. So good question. Okay, so uh, another uh, uh, really, really cool bird uh, in this lifestyle right now that, that generate questions are the American goldfinches. Now, to, I know that a lot of you, uh, if you've if it really paid attention, that while you know the numbers of cardinals really decrease and the chickadees, things like that, those during the nesting season are in territory and they don't allow the other chickadees around in your yard and stuff. So uh, your number goes down there, but your goldfinches stay in flocks. You guys have, uh, it, like my yard, I've had at least, I don't know, 10 to 20 goldfinches uh, uh, around all summer. And the, the reason for that is they're our latest nesting songbird. So 
uh, uh, goldfinches are just now starting to, to seek out nesting sites. And so what happens now in July, early July, especially the females will start to disappear and you, you'll have the males left and the females are moving and, and going out to nesting sites. And this one is grabbing a uh, uh, some nesting material from a cotton ball and they will go out and nest. And so you'll have this period in the next month of uh, the only seeing really the male goldfinches. Uh, the, the females will be out and they're incubating eggs and raising babies. And the males will come and go. But they, for the most part, you're not going to see the females for very much at all. Now, goldfinch, a couple of fascinating things about goldfinches, of course, is one is they're the, they, they do, they're one of very few birds, uh, uh, morning doves, of course, and that pigeon family uh, are others. But goldfinches don't feed their babies insects. And that's very, very rare. Um, they, insects are a source of calcium for baby birds or growing bones. So they, that's a lot of most birds' diets that they feed their babies or insects. Well, goldfinches feed their babies a regurgitated seed mix. And uh, so they, they gather seed. And that's one of the reasons why goldfinches never host, uh, oh, say never, never, rarely, rarely will a cowbird lay its egg in a, a, a goldfinch nest because their baby wouldn't survive because their baby would need those insects. Whereas the, and the goldfinch wouldn't be bringing insects to the nest to feed the, the baby cowbird. So uh, kind of a really cool thing there. And, and goldfinches are, are, are fantastic birds. We love them. Though what happens in a lot of this is the, uh, the, the gold, when the goldfinches are away uh, and they come back in, people go, and we'll talk about this next month because this will mainly happen in our August update, but they bring their babies back and people are like, what are these birds? Because they do look enough different. Uh, and of course, the male and female stuffing seeds in their mouth, they, well, they, they let you know they're baby goldfinches. But a lot of people get confused and we get a lot of uh, calls that time of year thinking they people have pine siskins because the, the baby goldfinches are darker and they're more green and uh, they look enough uh, alike. It was like I described with the, the hummingbirds earlier, you the male, female, and the young. Same thing with the goldfinches. You got those young ones will look a bit different. So be ready for that. Hi, Ellie. Yep, lots of goldfinches coming to the feeder. Mine are quite busy right now, too. As a matter of fact, I probably should have put some more black tie and fine chips out today or medium chips. They love them. Uh, and but they are, they're right on the first the start of the nesting season right now. So be ready for that. And then my purple Martin landlords, uh, this is a picture taken on July 2nd in 2005 by one of my customers. So if you can see this, these are uh, baby purple martins that are all stacked in, in this uh, box on this their grass nest there. And this is a state of, uh, of mer martins uh, around a lot of the area right now. They're getting really close to being able to fly. So what will happen is that the adults, of course, will stick with them and train them and teach them to fly and fly with them and, and show them the ropes on catching uh, insects from the air and things like that. And then they will be around your house for a little while longer and then all of a sudden they'll disappear. And what's happening is these, these Martins are going out and gathering up usually around lakes and you're in, of course they'll join in sometimes with, you know, tree swallows and other members of the, the swallow group. And they'll, you'll see huge numbers around wetland areas and around lakes and things like that. And they're fattening up for their migration sound because the purple Martins pretty much winter in uh, Brazil. And they'll be flying down there for the winter. But right now, we're right to the point where a lot of them are going to be fledging. So they, they, they your, your martins, if you live in this area, look like this. To the south, they probably are they already fledged. And to the north, you may be a little behind that. So martins are a very, very popular topic. People who are purple martin landlords absolutely love their purple martins. I, I don't blame them. So uh, a couple of, I just wanted to throw in here before we go to uh, turning over things to questions is... Uh, a, a couple of birds that are so unique that I like mentioning them. I mean, they're not going to come to your bird feeders, but a couple of things that are happening. Uh, I mentioned this bird uh, back in the spring. This is a uh, sedren, and they're a fascinating bird, uh, especially for this part of the world. The sedrens pass through here in the spring, and they go up to the prairie potholes in Canada and the northern tier states of North America and, and, and the United States, and they nest uh, in the spring, early summer. And then right now, in the next week or so, 
we'll start hearing them everywhere down here in our uh, prairie grasslands. And they'll, they start their migration south, they come here, and then they stop in our region, and they nest a second time which is really, really cool adaptation. So they get to, to nest in, uh, but in, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles apart uh, from where they originally nested. So fascinating bird, fascinating uh, lifestyle. It's, it's, it hasn't been really, they didn't figure this out until too many years ago. And it, it, it is an, an incredible uh, story with this bird. So let's see, we got Carol. Had an amazing visiting a bald eagle at our pond, Holt, Missouri. Uh, and, and I didn't mean to short the bald eagle when I said that the, the the bluebird was our most patriotic bird. Yes, I am well aware that bald eagles are, are our national bird, and they they there's no you can't look at that bird without going ah, you know. And and yeah, they they visit even small ponds. I, it, I've seen them along little stretches of river hunting. They they will hunt. Um, just about any wet area that you have. So that's really cool. You, that's a great yard bird to have, as we say. Um, they don't, not that many people have that, that uh, capability. So, all right. So for the marsh wren, I mean, the, how, the sedge wren, which is a story. And then the other thing going on in the bird world are shorebirds. Now, sandpipers and plovers and willets and, you know, wimbrels and all these guys. Okay. So these, Birds, net, mo most of these birds, a lot of these birds nest really up at the top of the world. And they put, they, they pass through here in the spring and we get to see them in migration and bird watchers like me, we get out and we go looking for them in our spotting scopes. And this is a solitary sandpiper, but they all move on. Most of them move on. There are some that nest near, but most of them move on. And then you would think that, okay, fall migration, that's going to be more like the hummingbirds and things and going to be more like, August, September, and, and then even October. Well, one thing that happens when you nest where these guys nest, which is way up at the top of the world, you only have one chance to nest. So if you're a male solitary sandpiper and you get up there and you can't attract a mate or you do attract a mate and your nest gets disturbed or, the, the, or your mate gets killed, then you might as well leave because you don't have time to go through the courtship and, and building a nest and laying the eggs and everything again. So a lot of those unpaired birds, as we call them, or uh, that birds that had to abandon their nest, instead of staying up there, they start moving their, they take, make their journey south. And we start seeing those shorebirds in late July and they turn up in wetlands around here. And so we start, that kind of starts the, the migration season for those those shorebirds. And that's what's going on there. If you look out and you see uh, uh, several shorebirds in, in, in a wet area and wonder what's going on, they're really early, but that's because they're likely one of those uh, disturbed uh, uh, birds that got got flushed out. So that's, a, that's another thing that goes on. Let's see. What's your favorite QC Quebec bird? Never been to Quebec, but I got a lot of favorite birds and I'm glad you texted that. I mean, put that up there because that is one that my next uh, appeal is uh, in two weeks, we are going to do a program on, I'm going to do a live on your favorite birds. And my favorite birds, and we're gonna talk about that. And what I, I made appeal for that, an appeal for this a couple of weeks ago, and I know a couple of you guys, Steve and David, a couple of people sent me a nice email uh, telling me why their bird favorite bird was, kind of a little history of what what turned them on to that bird and why they they like it. Um, and if you, more people will do that, we're gonna put this on the community uh, tab make an appeal there so that in, in two weeks I'll have several. But that night, I mean, if you don't want to write anything up, just know that night, the question of the night will be, what's your favorite bird? And uh, and if you want to type in a little more about why it's your favorite bird, uh, that's great. You know, we're going to, I'm of course going to be prepared to talk about a few uh, birds as well, because I can't have slides of every bird's available to, to talk about that night, but it would be great. I would be able to load them up if you guys want to send me something uh, on, like I said, be, either be prepared to comment and on the comment on it in the comment section, like here, or uh, if you want to send me uh, an email like uh, Steve and David did uh, at uh, mark at backyardbirdcenter.com. And we will uh, put that in the comments. Of course, it should be down there, but Melanie might want to post that so that you can uh, if you wanted to do it tonight, you can get started on that. And that way we're, I got a couple of weeks. 
um, whenever I'm broadcast, I'll be broadcasting from South Carolina that that week because uh, we'll be out there uh, at a family reunion, and so I'll be uh, in that part of the world. Let's see. Jordan, hello everyone. From just north of Pittsburgh. Nice hi, Jordan. Lived in Pittsburgh for a couple of years. Chickadees were building in my nest box and seemed to have abandoned it. Yeah. Found a small paper wasp nest after coming back from vacation. Um, they could be the culprit. Um, usually birds are pretty good at being able to fend off uh, once they're in the in the nest box, but uh, I, I wonder if the, the wasp didn't move in after the chickadees abandoned it. There's so many reasons why a bird will abandon a nest. I, I, I would when I lived in Pittsburgh and I was testifying um, and about a highway project where they were disrupting, uh, going to be disrupting a well-known uh, short-eared owl nest in near Pittsburgh. And the guy asked me in the test, asked me, to, why do birds choose to nest where they do? And that is an impossible question to answer. Um, but it's kind of the same thing. It, it can be as simple as that in the middle of the nest building, the chickadees may have seen a would-be predator, a cat may have crossed the yard, and, or a cooper's hawk flew the, and, and almost got one of the, the chickadees. And they thought, not safe here, and they move on. Because birds lay eggs on command. So they, they, it's nothing for them to abandon a nest and go start one somewhere else. So any number of things could have gone wrong that could have caused those chickadees to, to abandon it. I hate it, but that it, it's definitely very true. All right, let's see. Jordan, you can knock the nest down and try to light coat of Vaseline under the roof per Cialis website. Yep. Uh, chickadees are feeding in my yard but have not returned to the box. They may have already found another cavity somewhere to nest. It could be a knot hole in a tree or boy, chickadees will make a nest in just about anything. So, yeah, they uh, the wasp, you know, can be a problem. Uh, and, and, but for the most part, we as long as the, the nest box is monitored regularly, uh, you can usually keep them at bay. But, yeah, they, it, it, unfortunately, sometimes the wasps win. So, all right, good questions to get started off on the question and answer section. So um, I, I always open up here and you guys uh, type in comment, your questions here, and we'll talk about if I haven't covered something or you got more that you, you want me to talk about. Uh, and, and, and right up front, I, as, and I apologize if I don't get to your question, we'll try to, but when it gets there to the end, sometimes the questions are delayed and I've already logged off and questions come in. I feel really bad about that. Um, but uh, you cannot, like I said, we will try to get to everybody for sure. Let's see who we got next. Jan Miller, just curious, what is a bird's strongest sense of smell, eyesight, or hearing? Almost uh, definitely eyesight. Smelling is a poorly developed uh, sense in birds. And when you think about that, how, you know, uh, smell dissipates. Uh, so really, it's not a real useful uh, uh, sense for birds as a whole. Turkey vultures are the one uh, species that we know does have a very advanced uh, uh, sense of smell. Not, but even black vultures don't, which are related. So, um, you yeah, know, smell is by far the least developed. The strong, and eyesight is so important to birds. They are very much visual uh, when we like when we want to deter a woodpecker from hitting on their house on your house, things like that, we count on visual deterrence um, because it is so uh, important to them. So that's a really good question. All right, Jim, I know you. I'm filling my bird bath twice daily. Lots of birds munching on sizzling heat. Absolutely, the uh, it, it, you know me. If when I do my programs, uh, food, water, and shelter, and water is absolutely the single most important thing you can do for birds, uh, keeping it fresh and, and keeping it full, keeping it shallow uh, for the birds to utilize. So they're really, really using it. Uh, sizzling heat, a wonderful uh, blend of seed that has uh, treated with hot uh, chemical that or hot sauce. Jim can tell you what it is for sure. Um, but it is not harmful uh, to, to the mammals that uh, try to eat it, but it does discourage squirrels greatly. And, and my cat actually had good luck with it with raccoons as well. I had a customer one time who saw our sign for it and refused to ever shop at my store again because she couldn't believe I sold something that would, would harm um, animals. And I asked, I, 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 I wanted to ask her, I didn't get to because I wasn't there, but I want to say, ma'am, have you never not bitten into 
like a hot pepper or a, a food, a, a scoop of food that maybe was spicier than you wanted it to. And, and what did you do? You, you didn't take that second bite, right? You learned. And that's what this is about. And taste is a funny thing in birds too. And it's a very poorly developed sense of smell. And people realize that birds have a body temperature of 105 degrees. So the, the heat does not bother them. And as Jim has told me before, uh, you know, like in the parrot food world, they can't make uh, par uh, parrot food hot enough. They bird, God, parrots love hot peppers, so um, it's not harmful uh, and it's and it's not cruel. So um, that that uh, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, sometimes we do get customers that uh, feel very passionate. How do the bluebirds know when to lay first egg? Currently building their nests in the box. But how do they time their nest building to when they lay the egg? Okay, uh, the, how when they lay their first egg, a lot of time is food dependent, and that is whenever like if if they're not able to find a lot of insects at the time between their nest, they may delay their nesting until more insects are available because they have to know that there's going to be enough insects for them to feed those hungry mouths. And they'll lay that one egg a day for three days in a row or four days in a row or five days in a row, depending on how many they're going to end up laying. And the number of eggs egg is, is very much dependent on food availability. So that's why when people are, have a source of mealworms, especially live mealworms for them, that certainly gives them confidence to go ahead and lay those eggs and, and, and start nesting. Um, so that will de depend. So if it's been very dry, very hot, not a lot of insects, then that may delay them to nesting. That's why we talk about in that that August nesting when it's typically really hot and really dry, not as many insects, they may only lay, lay two eggs because they don't know, they know that it's going to be harder to keep up. All right, Alyssa, let's see what does placement of different types of feeders discourage birds from visiting. Um, you know what? I have never found that. Uh, Alyssa, I've been feeding birds for 40 years and my bird feeders are uh, clustered outside my family room window. I have finch feeders. I have, uh, you know, uh, suet logs. I have uh, open fly through feeders. I have peanut feeders and they're all mixed in together. And the birds have always fed together without any problem. Now, will like goldfinches, which are fairly timid birds, uh, will a goldfinch flush whenever a flicker comes in and lands on the peanut feeder? Yes. Because again, that's that eyesight and they see the size of a flicker coming in and they, their instincts are to run and hide. Once the flat and the flicker lands, it starts eating, and then the birds come back, the finches come back, and they start eating. So uh, there, there is some of that flight instinct to get away, but I have always found that, that the feeders being mixed like that, hummingbirds aren't afraid of anything. So even a hummingbird feeder hanging out here gets visited among uh, all the other feeders that are busy. So, yeah, I have never found that to be the plate. All right, let's see. Steve or bird, hot pepper seed does, doesn't bother them going in. What about coming out? Well, I think the same, the answer is the same when it comes to, you know, their body temperatures. I mean, their, their body temperatures are 105 and uh, versus us what are at 98. Um, so uh, it, there's never been any evidence that, that they're harmful. They believe me, I, it, we, that sizzling heat seed that we carry, um, it went from not even in my store to, to our third best selling bird seed in a very short period of time. We saw a lot of it and nobody is like, like you know, my birds don't come anymore. No, they come just as heavy and they, they eat it quite well. So, all right, let's see the legend. When is your next live? Next week live will be two weeks from tonight. Uh, I posted the date at 7 p.m. Central, even though we'll be in the Oh, looks, Melanie has posted the date and the time right there below us. Didn't even see that. And a link to the community post about the, the All right. birds. Okay, there Melanie posted that. Let's see. Steve, the hot pepper suet is a hit with my visiting birds. I guess the birds didn't get the memo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's uh, the hot pepper suet. Um, it's one of our best-selling suets that we, we carry, and that's because we're fairly urban, and so we have a lot of raccoon problems uh, in our area and squirrel problems. And the, the, the birds can eat the hot pepper suet, and it really does slow down uh, or even totally dissuade the, the you know, marauders like squirrels and, and raccoons. And, yeah, Steve, I know we've, sh we've shipped you some down there in, uh, in Alabama. Good to hear that it's working for you for sure. Oh, Melanie's post there. I'm going down here clicking. Wonderful thanks from New Jersey. Now you think you're letting know we join in, Alyssa. That's great. Absolutely. Let's see, I think Joshua... 
Southwestern Michigan. I recognize that name. Yep. Welcome in. Uh, we are in that, that, uh, like I say, the question and answer uh, part of it. And uh, it is, it is a lot going on. I mean, it, I love the, the number of you know, like for different parts of the world, but we're all bird people, you know, and that's why it, 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 you guys are, uh, they're great, and you, you, no matter where you live, you you have that be- that interest in birds. Where are my blue jays? Haven't seen one in weeks. They are usually regulars in my yard. Tit mice have been taking all the peanuts <laughs> lately. I don't uh, normally get a lot of tit mice. They are bringing their babies. That's great, Jordan. Um, you, you're two birds that you right there that are related, and that is uh, the tit mice. And the blue jays are both very oak dependent species. So if you have them, that means you've got oak trees somewhere because that is very much what they depend on. And what they, you know, the the blue jays are the Johnny Apple seeds of the oak world. They they collect acorns, and I don't know what state your vegetation is, Jordan, where you're at, but the um, they. they Whenever the acorns come in, boom, they, you lose the blue jays. They are going to be, and the tit mice as well. They're, they love it and store a lot of those. Uh, the, the blue jays are hilarious how they bury them. But the, like I said, the end shell peanuts are a favorite of blue jays. And I, no matter when I put them out, I can always depend on the blue jays finding them within a day. And they're coming in and they'll take every one of them that I'll lay out there. Um, the ten, tit mice tend to prefer the shelled peanuts and the mixtures like nut and berry and some of the other uh, birdseed mixes that have peanuts in it. And so they visit and, uh, they'll, and they'll store them as well. But during the during the nesting, whenever they're feeding babies, they have to feed their babies, you know, other things. And 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 when you know, blue jays are, you know, they'll maraud eggs and nest and babies from nest. And they uh, they. They will do that kind of thing, but also insects. And they have, you know, so they're, you know, they don't feed their babies uh, peanuts. So they're having to feed on other things. So you might be at the height of your nesting right now with their, them feeding their babies is where they are. Um, and, and they, but they'll be back, believe me. And then remember in the fall, if you've got a good acorn crop, your blue jays will be taken care of and they probably will visit your feeders less. Jan, thanks, Melanie. Thank you. Yeah, great. I don't know what I'd do without my producer over there. I have Ellie, I have 15 different birds coming to my tiny patio area. And thank you, Ellie. And absolutely, Ellie's one of our regular customers. And a lot of people ask that question right there. Well, I live in an apartment. All I have is a little patio. Can I get birds to come to it? And Ellie is testament right there. Yeah, they you build it, they will come. Now it may take you a little longer. It, you know, you, if you don't have habitat, but it really helps if you you do have some trees close by your patio. The birds feel safer coming in there. But absolutely, Ellie, it, 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 can you believe me? I know the amount of bird seeds you buy. You feed a lot of birds off that patio. Jordan, you are welcome. Thank you. Let's see what we got here. Oh, now I've got to put a tab there to the community page uh, so you can leave your favorite birds on there. Remember, in two weeks, like I said, I'll, I'll be out of town, but we're still going to do the live from uh, from South Carolina to where I'm going to work going to be. And uh, we'll, I, my, my audio might not be quite as good because I'm going to have my really good microphone here, but um, they, we will do uh, they, their favorite birds. I love these stories. I love how what got you started and interested in birds. I, you know, a lot of times somebody has a you know a grandparent or uh, or you know, something that we call them click birds, and that is that that bird that when you saw it or you learned a cool fact about it, kind of went click <laughs> and you went wow and made you look up you know another bird or more birds and um, and like I said, it, there's everybody has a different story and that's great to share and and especially inspire people to really get going and, and this great hobby. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, Blue Jay, it's love almonds out of the shell, Steve said. Yeah, you're right about that. We we used to be able to get a, a really cool mix, a, a bird seed mix that were, um, we actually called them floor sweepings from planters, uh, that it was a bag of mixed nuts that were not human consumption quality. And there were almonds in there. And then definitely, uh, and, and it's funny because the woodpeckers tend to favor the softer nuts that were in there, like cashews and things like that. Um, but then when it got down to the harder nuts, like, like almonds are very hard, blue jays are ones that would do it. It would take care of and take them off. Absolutely, Steve. You are welcome, and, and we appreciate the, you guys joining in. That's absolutely. Oriana Fisher, I, I from Ontario, Canada. Glad to catch you live. 
always been something new from you, your videos and live stream. I appreciate that. I like I said, it helps me to know that you guys are enjoying it, and it really helps me if you guys send me ideas for topics you want me to talk about because. Uh, you know, I, I, I you guys send something and I go, oh, wow. Yeah, that is a really good idea because uh, I'm always writing down ideas anywhere, anywhere I am. I think of something to talk about and I've got little pieces of paper everywhere. I, it, yes. My wife is laughing at me over there and I do. I have food <laughs> ideas on them everywhere. And I really, if I were an accountant, I would probably have a really good organized system. But us uh, wildlife biologists don't or don't quite think that way. So. Here's Roscoe, 90, I, I know you joined in before, had starring show up at my Peter for the first time ever. Oh, God, are you a lucky human being? Eventually stopped putting out mealworms, and it seems to have disappeared. Haven't been back in a week. Yeah, the starlings, wham. <laughs> you talk about opportunistic feeders. When they discover a food source, and mealworms are certainly one of them, that's when I, yeah, I put those mealworms out for my Carolina wrens and chickadees and bluebirds. Boy, if a starling shows up, they're gone in no time. They just clean them out and they, and you hate that, but, uh, I, you know, I don't have a cage to be, there are caged mealworm feeders that work really well uh, that the bluebirds can get into and the chickadees and wrens, but the starlings can't get into. So you may check into that or else can see if that is something that may work for you. Marilyn, Pallied Woodpecker was at my sister's. My starter bird, oh, oh, it was your starter bird. I'm sorry, but I still haven't gotten one. Yeah, I mean, it can be a, and we, <laughs> that's funny because, you know, for bird watchers, there are those, those birds that escape us, you know, they target birds and, you know, they, and they, I, I remember for years and years and years, rusty blackbirds were a bird for me that I, I hadn't seen. And I should have seen that bird as a, as many hours and hours and hours I spend in the field bird watching. And, and some, there are some birds like that. And piney woodpeckers are pretty secretive. They can, but you know, and then like my sister called me one day at work at Fort Bragg and said, Mark, I got a woodpecker in my yard. He's as big as a chicken. And it was of course a piney woodpecker. And, and uh, so they're around and in Kansas City area, I always tell people, you know, where you got your bigger timber. You know, here at Kansas City Zoo is a really good place to see them and hear them because there's a lot of big trees down there and they, they nest down there. Uh, so, yeah, you, you got to be in the field. You know, and sometimes they'll show up in your backyard, but if you're out hiking in really good wooded area, that that can be a big thing. So, Megan, thanks for all your great information. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for helping me feel better about the squirrel who lost his finger in the baffle the other day. Right, Megan? I, I have told that story at work uh, today. We were sharing that about how God, freak accidents can happen. And that, that was a, a, she had a story where a, a squirrel got its toe caught in a, in a bracket and, and things can happen. I mean, all freak accidents can, can occur like that. And, but the squirrel, you know, it's amazing. They, they, it's, it, it's kind of harsh to say, but they doesn't even miss that, miss that finger. They, the wild animals are, are, are tough, tougher than we give them credit for, but, uh, that, that is something you just can't guard against. It, 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 the craziest things can happen, and just right angle, just you know, and 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 I hate that happen. I'm sorry, it did. All right, Joshua, Mark, I'm taking a trip down to South Florida. Oh God, are there any cool birds? <laughs> I should keep my eye out for them. Never birded there before, Joshua. You're going to a really good place. <laughs> there, uh, South Florida. You're going to see. Uh, again, so much of the the big wading birds, the roseate spoonbills and and uh, snowy egrets, tons of them down there, and great egrets and and hingas, the snake birds and wood storks and oh my gosh, South Florida is a mecca. Uh, it is a great place to go. And then you know they have a resident population of spot-breasted orioles down there, um, which they don't have anywhere else in the United States, but down right down in that corner there, they were introduced there years ago, and the, and the population got established. Uh, swallowtail kites are one of my favorite birds, and they nest there, but they migrate pretty early, so keep your eyes out for those. I don't know where all you're going, but uh, oh, snail kites, I, I, I could talk about South Florida for hours, but yes, Joshua, they, uh, it's a great place to go bird watching and good luck down there. Or, oh, a blue bunting sighting day that, that might possibly indigo, indigo bunting. Uh, I, yep. That would definitely be indigo bunting. Yep. The blue bunting is, is an actual species, but it's a, a Mexican bird and only, it really doesn't come any further than North and they are in the field guides. They do look a lot alike. Um, uh, but the indigo is an all blue and, and that's a, a bird that would be fairly common uh, where you're at. Uh, it, 
and that and come to feeders occasionally, but more common in the field. Absolutely, Joshua. Good luck down there. Mary Lawson got Anhinga last year in Cape May, New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty far north for Anhinga, but they they they're wondering. Uh, back when I was uh, growing up in North Carolina, we never saw Anhingas, and now I can go find them in, in in areas along the coast in North Carolina pretty easily, and, and working their way up the coast. So. That's a bird that's expanding its range. Good job. Joshua didn't know about the Orioles. Yes, the Orioles are, uh, I, it was a life bird for me, but two years ago, a year and a half ago, when we were down there. I went to a park that was known for them. And uh, sure enough, I had two of them in a tree and they are beautiful birds, a good size Oriole too. Um, so yeah, I'd be on the lookout for those down there. Yeah, absolutely lucky to see it. You, that's that's a really good bird for that far north. Absolutely, you're right. Uh, we we get them occasionally. They may show up here in Missouri, down in especially in the south eastern part of the state called the Boot Hill of Missouri. That there's a lot of uh, swamp land down there, and sometimes we get anhingas show up down there and wood storks and rosy spoonbills. But uh, all three of those birds are yet they, you know, they're going to start nesting. I would bet a lot of them in that part of the state in, in, in the near future. So. Gosh, guys, it's been a great program. Thanks so much for joining in. I hope you'll send in your favorite birds that we can talk about in a couple of weeks. I'll be posting a couple of videos between now and then, Monday night and then probably and next Thursday night. But two weeks from tonight will be the Watch Your Favorite Bird and kind of what got you inspired to start bird watching shows. So thank you all for joining in. I Again, if I miss your, missed a comment, I apologize. You can always send me an email with your question. And you, you always, you know, like I say at the store, come on, let's talk birds. Thanks so much.